Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, why don't we get started? It looks like uh, there's still some people uh, uh, coming in, uh, but we want to get started on time here and be respectful of everyone's uh, time and uh, make sure you have your chances to network. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Ladd. I'm the administrator for the Office of Apprenticeship at the U.S. Department of Labor, and I'll be your moderator for today's session, Finding the Right Workforce. So I'm really excited about this, uh, this panel today. We've assembled a all-star panel, and I'm going to introduce them to you uh, here in just a few minutes. Um, but let me just uh, take a couple minutes to frame the issue a little bit and talk a little bit about what's happening uh, from the perspective of the U.S. Department of Labor, and particularly my office, the, the Office of Apprenticeship. Um, so as many of you know, uh, we have a tremendous skills gap issue here uh, in the United States. Uh, despite record low unemployment, we have over 7 million jobs across the United States that uh, employers say they're having trouble filling. Right? So that is a, a big number, a big challenge. And so this is something that is very important to this administration. Um, and uh, we're looking at workforce development from a lot of different perspectives. Hopefully many of you will be here tomorrow. You'll hear from uh, Senior Advisor Ivanka Trump will also be talking about workforce development. And so uh, today's topic is, is really timely. Um, from an apprenticeship perspective, uh, this administration feels very strongly that apprenticeship can be one of the answers uh, to these workforce challenges. Right? If we have 7 million jobs we can't fill, part of the answer has to be growing our own and developing our own workforce. And that's where apprenticeship uh, fits in. Uh, the good news is we're having tremendous success. We're seeing um, uh, historic levels of interest in apprenticeship, new employer starting apprenticeship models all across the country, and record numbers. Uh, last year, we had over 230,000 people start an apprenticeship program uh, here in the United States. We're nearing half a million new apprentices since the start of the administration. So these are numbers we haven't seen uh, in decades. And uh, we're, we're seeing this not just in traditional industries and traditional occupations, but new industries and new occupations. So uh, we're really thrilled to see that progress. Um, but you can see there's a little bit of a mismatch there, right? We're talking about hundreds of thousands of apprentices, but millions of jobs that are unfilled, right? So we have an order of magnitude problem, uh, and we really need to scale up uh, successful workforce development strategies, including apprenticeship. And so on the apprenticeship front, the administration's taking a number of steps to look, to look at how we can scale apprenticeship across the United States. Uh, and this began about two years ago. We're coming up on an, uh, an anniversary here of an executive order on expanding apprenticeship in the United States. Really exciting for us in the apprenticeship world where we have an executive order stating it's the policy of the United States to promote and expand apprenticeship. So we're excited to see that commitment to apprenticeship. Uh, under that executive order, a, a task force on apprenticeship expansion, uh, a presidential task force was stood up. Uh, that committee met uh, and finished its work about a year ago, issued, issued a report. Uh, I encourage you to go on our website at dol.gov. You, you can see that, that report, lots of really great recommendations, and a number of which uh, we're acting on at the Department of Labor. Um, and then later this year, we're going to be uh, rolling out some new policy and some new guidance and regulations around a new option around apprenticeship. We've had one kind of traditional model of apprenticeship in the US. Uh, we'll be rolling out what we're calling industry recognized apprenticeship, which gives a little bit more flexibility to industry uh, to design apprenticeship programs that meet the needs of their particular industry. So uh, that should be coming out shortly. Uh, and again, this is a big innovation and new development uh, in the apprenticeship space. So we're really excited about the opportunities around apprenticeship, but we've got uh, experts here from industry, from economic development that can talk more broadly about um, how uh, communities are coming together, both uh, industry and, and public sector partnerships, uh, to address these workforce challenges because they are uh, uh, very, very severe and, and, and uh, pressing in communities all across the United States and all across uh, a range of industries. So what we're going to do in our 
our panel here is I'm going to introduce just very briefly uh, our, our distinguished panel. Uh, I'll let you know who they are, their titles. Um, but I'm going to ask them to speak a little bit more about about who they are, their organization, um, and then talk more specifically about you know, the challenges that they see around uh, the skills challenge and finding the right workforce, uh, some of the solutions that they've developed, and the opportunities they see uh, for replication. So we're going to give about five minutes to each of our speakers to, uh, to cover that. We do hope at the end that uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, there's, I think, no cards going around, so if people want to write down their questions and give them to uh, this fine gentleman here, um, he will collect those, and we ha will have a live microphone as well for Q&A. So with that, let me introduce our panel. Um, so going from my right to uh, the far end of the uh, stage, we have Dr. Vera Krekanova, points for getting that right, uh, Chief Research Officer at uh, Allegheny Conference on Community Development. Uh, next, we have Dan Lawler, Senior Vice President, Human Resources North America for Teva uh, Pharmaceuticals. Uh, next, we have Don Pearson, Secretary of Economic Development, State of Louisiana. And then we have Charlie Yao, President and Chief Executive Officer, YCA Methanol One. So you can see we've got a great panel here uh, representing both industry and economic development um, and the perfect people to talk about this issue. So with that, I'm going to uh, just go down the line here and we'll start with Vera and, we'll, and you have your five minutes. Great. Thank you, John. Good afternoon. My name is Vera Krakanyeva, and I come from Pittsburgh, or the greater Pittsburgh uh, area. Um, I work at an entity that uh, focuses on economic development in the southwestern Pennsylvania region. So we are, we are about the 10-county uh, region bordering Ohio, uh, West Virginia, uh, Virginia, on, on that end of Pennsylvania. And we, we focus on, on uh, economic development and sort of our end goal is, which I, I am sure it's familiar to many of you in this space, it's uh, making sure that our region is a thriving region. And, and uh, we sort of, uh, our strategies are investments in strong economy, um, investment in thriving people, and investment in quality of place. And so workforce and workforce issue penetrate all these three areas, right? Without, uh, without uh, people with the right skills and enough people, uh, we cannot have a strong economy. Without good jobs and, and, and good matches between jobs and, and people's skills, we can't have a thriving uh, resident. And, and we need both of that to invest in, in the, the place and the, the quality of place we have. Uh, we're fortunate to have in Western Pennsylvania. Um, my role specifically, it's, it's to drive uh, strategies uh, mostly around um, sort of translating data and, and insight and information into so what. And, um, and again, workforce is somewhere in the, the crossroad, right? So uh, it's in, in my role, I look at the, what, where we've been, uh, what's, what's happening, what's, um, what's happening now and where we're, where we're heading, but also how do we compare to regions that we, uh, we compete with or we, um, we, we, we thrive to, uh, to, to catch up with. Um, some of the uh, investments that we do around workforce um, have things to do with, uh, with talent attraction. Uh, we want more people in Western Pennsylvania, so we look at how to attract people, how to engage them, how to retain them. Uh, we also are fortunate enough to have a lot of people coming uh, to take advantage of the 60 plus higher education uh, institutions that we have in our region. But then uh, many of them leave after they graduate, so we also focus on talent retention. How do we retain uh, the, the 40,000 graduates every year that we, we, we have in, in, in our region? Um, and we also focus on, on the sort of uh, the issues around upskilling uh, or, or, um, or maybe um, more than upskilling to making sure that uh, people at, at, any, at any level and at, at any age have the right skills to, to keep up with the, with the economy. We're very fortunate uh, to, to, have, um, to have some strong momentum around innovation 
economy in our region, and, uh, and that's, that's across sectors. We have uh, strong manufacturing based, strong healthcare, strong business presence, and all of these sectors, as you know, innovate and, and change, and they change the occupations they have. And so part of our strategy is how do we make sure that people in our region keep up with the, with the, with the new occupation, the new skills demand, um, and, 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 and can see the opportunity they have in the, in the new economy. So I'll stop there. Uh, obviously, we use a lot of uh, data, data-driven approach. But but how things get really uh, happen in in Pittsburgh is through strong collaboration. We are a business-led entity, but we work very closely with uh, with our uh, local, state government, uh, federal government as well, but also our philanthropy and, and other civic leaders. Great, yeah, great. great. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, Dan Lawler, I lead human resources for Teva Pharmaceuticals North America. Teva Pharmaceuticals is the world's leading generic pharmaceutical company. Uh, we're headquartered in Israel. We have 43,000 employees. And uh, North America in the United States represents actually the largest market for Teva. So certainly, uh, workforce development is really important. Finding the workforce is very important. but. In my role, it's more than just finding the workforce. It's also um, how do we truly attract them, how do we motivate them, and how do we retain them. The, the labor market for pharmaceuticals is, is quite competitive, so we need to differentiate ourselves in some ways, um, not just when we find uh, candidates, but also how do they choose Teva over our competitors. And then once they come to Teva, how do we get them to be motivated, um, high performing, and to stay with us uh, for as long as possible? Uh, these are the types of challenges you know, that we face, and I think they're somewhat similar to what Vera described from a different perspective. Um, some of the things that we've done in terms of recruiting is we went to what we call a RPO model, recruitment process, process outsourcing. Um, we, we linked up with a particular company that is an expert in talent acquisition, and um, they pretty much do the recruiting for us in partnership with us. And what's nice about that is that they have broad reach, but also you know, we ebb and flow in terms of our hiring needs. So we don't have this full workforce of recruiters uh, working for us, but we're leveraging a firm that can ebb and flow as our, as our needs ebb and flow. Um, the other thing about finding employees is, of course, the, the old days of classified ads are gone. Uh, a lot is done through social media. Uh, so we have partnerships with uh, companies like LinkedIn and Glassdoor, where many of our opportunities are um, posted. And we also get very interesting statistics and data on the applicant flow and the types of people that are uh, visiting our jobs and uh, hitting, hitting those sites. So that's some of the things we've done on the recruiting side. Uh, on, on the development and training, um, we also are leveraging uh, technology to a large degree. So we offer online programs uh, for all levels of our workforce. Some of that is required, um, particularly around regulatory and compliance, but a lot of it is elective. So employees can really tap into their own self-development uh, to pick things that interest them. We also offer specialized training for our managers, and this is really key because you know, the data shows that most employees either stay or leave an organization based on the relationship with their manager. So we put extra investment and focus into our management development training to ensure that um, those people that are dealing directly with our employees on a day-to-day -day basis are um, being effective in their roles. And then I think, um, thirdly, when we look at high potential employees and executive development, we do have partnerships uh, with academic institutions and their executive education departments. Uh, for instance, we're just now in the design phase with uh, University of Pennsylvania Wharton on a, an academy for our top commercial talent. And we're looking really forward. And I know some of the people that will be attending that program are very much looking forward to it. So there, there are an a few examples of things we're doing from inside a company to help uh, attract and motivate and retain our talent. But I think for me, the one thing that overarches all of that is your work environment and your culture. And we're doing a lot now to really ensure that we're um, putting in place a one type of culture. Uh, and that, that has aspects to it. Um, 
One is a lot around inclusion and diversity. It's really important, once you bring all these people to your organization, that they all feel like they belong and they can all make a difference. Um, another one is our mission and our values. People need to find meaning in their work, so we've gone a long way uh, to help with understanding our mission and our values, and not just understanding, but living them day in and day out. And then I think probably a third would be corporate social responsibility. Um, we see this as really important now in people's choice of which organizations they join, uh, that their organization is kind of giving back to the communities and they're really making a difference in the world. So um, we've really increased our efforts around corporate social responsibility and the involvement of our employees in those efforts as well. So I'll, I'll stop there, uh, but that gives you a flavor from, from the inside of an organization of what we're doing. Great, great. Secretary Pearson. Well, we can have a very lengthy conversation today. Um, I'm sure we can't cover all the topics uh, in the time allocated. Um, certainly here with uh, two users that certainly uh, bring their perspective uh, uh, to workforce and meeting the demands, their, their corporate demands. But you know, from a larger, more strategic uh, standpoint, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a critically important topic uh, to governments, uh, to corporations, uh, to citizens, uh, all of the entire uh, system that make up uh, what, what workforce is. Um, some extraordinary trends uh, right now, sort of a uh, rural to urban migration that's happening out there. It's very uh, challenging for our rural states and rural communities right now to retain any kind of talent at all. Um, certainly beyond this is the uh, technology backdrop uh, that's changing. You talked about uh, 7 million uh, jobs available in the U.S. right now. 700,000 of those jobs are in technology. And going forward, even just uh, more than, say, uh, the three to four years from now, IBM tells me, that there will be 120 million workers that have new skills, uh, new software, uh, new elements of their job performance to learn. So uh, this whole integration of uh, 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 being able to um, navigate uh, the new jobs, the jobs of tomorrow, jobs that can't even be described today, uh, put us in a position where we have to be able to um, uh, not skate to the puck but skate to where the puck is going to be. Uh, so this is going to require apprenticeship, a great start, uh, but certainly we recognize that it begins with early childhood education. It continues with children that are ready to learn uh, in, their, in their school systems. Um, it, it extends uh, into credentials now that our community colleges and even in K through 12, young people can learn uh, portable credentials that they can take on uh, to the jobs that they will uh, uh, hopefully secure in that, uh, in that future point in time. And we know that uh, talent is that currency uh, of technology. Uh, and not all jobs are gonna be tech jobs. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of manufacturing jobs. There's gonna be jobs that aren't in a workplace, whether it is a home-based office or that uh, Uber driver, that, that's his office. Uh, uh, all the different uh, systems that are at play right now are radically changing uh, what, what uh, has traditionally been uh, a model that we've thought of in, uh, in fairly narrow terms. And again, as we move into artificial intelligence, virtual reality, uh, all these uh, new fields, they will cross over, not into uh, just uh, entertainment and, uh, uh, and manufacturing operations, uh, but those, uh, those same elements will be a part of the training that we execute for workers. Uh, in Louisiana today, we are building training modules in uh, virtual and augmented reality for ExxonMobil. So uh, there's a, a tremendous challenge that, that lies ahead of us. Uh, it will require participation from many different elements uh, and, and certainly the outcome that we all seek are these uh, uh, elements of a vibrant economy, uh, quality jobs, uh, and, and a, a sense uh, that you're contributing uh, that's so important to uh, retaining workers in the workplace today. So uh, those are some of the things that we could uh, touch on uh, in our conversation. Great, great. Mr. Yeah? 
Thank you. And uh, my name is Charlie Yao, and I'm running the YCI Methanol 1. Uh, so I'm sure everybody in this room, and many of you, right, you come here probably for two things. Right? Number one, you try to make a decision to invest in the U.S. And or some of you have already made decision to invest. Now you think about how we're going to run it, okay? And uh, for YCI, we have gone through both journey. So I want to take this opportunity to share with you how we handle those tough questions. So uh, and today's topic is more around uh, workforce development. So I'm not going to share too much about what's the journey it takes to make a decision, right? I'm assuming you have made decision. You're going to take the second step, which how am I going to staff it at Ryan? Okay. Quickly, background. And uh, YCM Method One is really a subsidiary of a Chinese investment uh, in, from China. We took this journey in 2014 to build a $1.8 billion uh, chemical plant, which makes 1.8 million tons of methanol a year. So that's a world class, world scale plant. So we're building. <clears throat> we are about 60% complete. We spend over a billion dollars already. So a billion point two. So we have $600 million to go. And uh, by mid of next year, we are finished the mechanical completion. And so we currently have more than 1,000 construction workers at site to basically finish building it. <clears throat> and by mid of next year, we finish mechanical completion. This plant will start and run. And it will. It's, it's a state-of-art design plan, and we employ over 150 high-skilled workers. What, what I'm calling high-skilled worker is the base pay rate is $80,000 a year. Those are really what they call the quality jobs <clears throat> that require to staff around this plant. So it's a chemical plant, right? So you are not going to build in the highly dense population areas, right? The only place you can get permit, and thanks for the state of Louisiana, and allow us to select site, offer the incentive program, and help us to select a site. It's going to be a rural area. That's what chemical plants are supposed to be located. So regardless of who you are, and either high tech or uh, the traditional manufacturing company, you're going to need to find qualified and skilled workers to staff it. And that is the challenge I'm having, right? So over the last five years, I have the fortune to be able to build a billion dollar project. Now I have to build a billion dollar company now, basically to run. That is a challenge over the head of the company. So what are the challenges we have is given in the rural uh, Louisiana areas, you need to find high skilled workers. What do you do? Right. So I think that some of the challenges we handle, I'm not going to give you all the answers. Some of us are just searching to solve but angle that we take to approach this challenge will be, number one, you have to be a kind of welcome employee, employer that people want to work for you. Right? So you must do some basic things. Number one, you must build a safe <clears throat> plan that people want to work, right? Nobody wants to come to work plan that's not safe. That's your basics, right? You must have attractive uh, employment, <coughs> sorry, packages. You underpay the worker, give them the low unemployment rate, right? You give them the below average uh, salaries, you're not gonna attract high skill workers. So one thing we learn, right? The for high school worker, for the high, when you hire today, that does not have a job, you're gonna have a challenge to bring them in to make part of your core team. Right? I cannot say everybody does not have a job is not good, but who do not have a job cannot be base of your employment base, right? <coughs> Which means you need to attract the talent from other employers to be able to run. Okay? And how you do that? So you need to offer the reasonable good and competitive incentive programs for them of some of the unique employee benefit packages <clears throat> and without going through the detail. So you must come across that. That's the basics. You do have to provide the opportunity for people when they made the decision to jump from one employer to you. They, other than the money is one thing, they got to have something else for, for that, right? That's called opportunity for growth. 
Okay, you don't address that, people come in, they're not challenged, they're bored, and they move on, right? So, <clears throat> and how to find them? It is really the people like us, right? Come from a, well, I have uh, stayed in this company for many years, given my employee history, but as a foreign direct investment, investor, you come in, and how do you find qualified workers? Not by yourself. There are many, many resources that you can access if you know how to get there. And the US government at all levels are ready and willing and capable to help you. So I made a great friend with Tom Pearson as the Secretary of the Economic Development for the State of Louisiana, right? He's one signed the the what they call incentive packs with me, represent the state of Louisiana. His department also offers a lot of the resources. And I will let him to e elaborate a lot more that from early uh, marketing your, your company, marketing the jobs available, staging the job fairs, provide early screening, testing, and provide early basic trainings, that's all offered by the state. Many of the states actually do that. So if access to right government resources, it's great helpful. Don't do it yourself, okay? There are plenty of helpers, including all the way up to the, the Commerce Department, okay? <clears throat> so that's, that's number two, right? Number three also requires is to think of a long vision. I remember uh, 2014, that's five years ago, we started this journey, and I went to a high school and to start to support called the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, math program, right? And the first people said, why you be interested in STEM? Are you faking? A lot of companies said, when I told them I have a PhD in chemistry, they said, yeah, you, you believe STEM. So, and uh, the point I try to make is the asset you all, we invest is what? Minimum 30 to 50 years. But that's the asset life. So the high school student, what I'm talking to, I knew five years later, they will be finished college. Those are the ones, if not your today's workforce, they are your future workforce. Think of long, think of reputation. When you build up, when, when they pick and choose an employee to go, your name is the first come to their mind, you have to win the game. Okay, so do something around that one. I can talk all the details of what we have done with the schools, with the board, with the PTA, parent teachers association, many more things you do. Keep that. You not only solve your today's employee problem, you do have to solve it, the succession plan issues that five, ten years beyond. So I stop here and I have many more stories to tell, have mm -hmm. been gone through that. So. That's great. Uh, that's just really powerful in terms of how you broke that down and, and uh, laid it all out for everybody. Um, I have a number of questions uh, on my list, but I'm hoping everybody starts thinking about the questions that they have for the panel because we'll get to you really shortly here. Um, but Vera, maybe I could come back to you. You talked broadly about the use of data and the partnerships that you've developed. I imagine everybody kind of has access to similar kinds of data and, and uh, understands, you know, partnerships that are out there, but can you talk a little bit about some of the unique ways or, or something or, you know, a, a model that you see as replicable or scalable across the country? So uh, I'll, I'll give you a sort of very specific example how we use data to drive strategy and then I'll tell you a little bit about our, our framework for the for the data. Um, let me start with the framework. We, we selected early on sort of a, a, a bench, 15 benchmark regions uh, that have similar uh, uh, similar sort of economy, and uh, and then the, then divided them in three uh, three groups. Uh, one group, it's the sort of the the peer group that, that they are doing just about the same we are, you know. So they're sort of our, peer. and then uh, the competitive regions. So that's a that's a thir third of our benchmarks that are that we constantly compete uh, with for business attraction, and sometimes or, or you know often they win, and we w we wanted sort of to. to keep that in mind. And then there are aspirational regions that uh, they are outperforming us and, and we sort of want to understand how, how they got to it. And uh, we look at everything, every piece of data, every piece of information and sort of keep it, keep it uh, constantly moving on these 
15 benchmark and see what, what's, who is doing what and, and how. And from there, really sort of build some, uh, some models for, for analytics and, and think about, well, what if, right? What if we mix these ingredients? What would happen there? Uh, we are obsessive about talking to people. So it's not just the data, but we would call our benchmark regions colleagues and, and, and keep asking them about, about what they do in, in, in their um, strategies, how they measure impact, all of that. So, so that's really more sort of the model how we think. But uh, let, me, let me go back to the sort of the, the issue um, around um, talent retention. As I said, we graduate about 40,000 uh, students every year in, in the, the sort of the greater uh, Pittsburgh region. And about half of them leave. And uh, we were sort of puzzled, like, A, we didn't want them to leave. And then uh, we, we, we thought, like, why would they leave? Pittsburgh is the most livable city. And if you haven't been there, please come to visit. It is true. We, we, <laughs> it's a great place. But we had such a large portion of students leaving. And so uh, what we did are uh, several things. One was, uh, you know, uh, gather some hypotheses. One hypothesis was there's no jobs for these students. And it was like, well, we can quickly dispel that. We look at their major. We will look at what they graduated with. We look at the labor market, and there is a match. There was very few uh, majors that are sort of like, let's say, marine biology, and we don't have coast, right? Uh, but, but most of it was in line. So then we looked at the job posting and analyzed, you know, and now with technology, and I'm sure you have the same tools, we can analyze what's the, uh, every job posting that there is. And we had 50, 60,000 job posting, and we look at the requirements there, and we compare it to the, to the profiles of the graduates. Mm -hmm. And one of the things was that uh, consistently what we saw that uh, most of our jobs, job posting, said a bachelor's degree, two, two to three years of experience. That was the majority of the jobs. And um, so that was, we, we knew we were onto something, right? And so then we sort of assemble focus group with these different students and they confirm that the, one of the thing is, I don't have two to three years experience. I have, a, a, I have a bachelor's degree, but I don't have the experience. I have to go somewhere else to, to, to get it, right? And um, that was a, in a way no brainer. And I am sure you, you all experienced that, that when, when employers sort of drive the, the, the talent selection, they, they put the requirements because they want to get the best of the best and, and make sense, right? Uh, but we sort of, with this data and, and just building some of the awareness, uh, we brought the, the business community together. And I, I mentioned we're business-led, so we, we have a, a easy access. We have about 400 employers plus others uh, that are willing to work with us. And so we said, look at, look at what we're doing here collectively. We're driving the students away. So that was a, a very quick win uh, that we saw a, a lot of employees dropping the two to three years of requirements because they, they, they knew they were reducing their talent pool. And obviously, you, you, you want skills that you want experience, but you might want to uh, build it. One other thing that we did from there, if you really need experience, how we can collectively build it uh, in, in the region. And uh, again, a no-brainer initiative, like we should all have employ uh, internship opportunities, right? And a lot of companies do, but we also realize and we, we analyze how many of our companies actually have internship uh, uh, established. And we were uh, shocked, uh, along with, with our partners on, in the business community, how few of them actually do, and those who do, how, how deep the experience or how actually there's not a lot of depth in the experience. And so we thought, OK, well, this is something we could do, right? We could, we could uh, you know, let's keep asking the students what else is there. And and then let's calibrate the, uh, the, the internship experience for it. And so we, we continue to ask the students, and we realize that um, they have nothing against Pittsburgh, but they didn't experience it. So they were busy on campus studying and, and majoring, right? But they didn't explore the region for everything that has to offer, vibrant um, uh, outdoor activities and, and, and arts and all of that. And also, they did not know the, the, the employers in the region. They, they are not thinking that way. And they, they would just, whoever comes to com campus to recruit, they would just sign up with them. It didn't matter where they were. And so we started to build uh, uh, this program. Again, it sort of sounds simple, but uh, we, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, actually impact that we had. Um, 
several companies that did internship really well, um, um, and they came together and say, we can share how we do it if others want to replicate. So we created a cohort of businesses. We have five that were, that were the stars, and then they were, we had 30 that wanted to learn, and spent a couple weeks around sort of exchanging best practices. And then we mo mobilized the community around um, to offer the experience for the interns. And so this year, we have uh, 1,500 students students uh, across 40 companies, um, and they, they do have their jobs, um, and, but they, they get to do all the different social and professional networking and, and you name it, activities that everybody pitches in. Um, and you know, they go to kayak, they go to ballpark, they go to have CEO uh, lunch, uh, breakfast with CEOs, they go to open houses to different companies, <clears throat> they go to bus tours to see the regions. And obviously, we're, we're, we're again analyzing, we get feedback, we analyze what they tell us, we, we get their directions. But this is one, one of the most recent uh, examples of how we sort of took the data, sort of said, this doesn't make any sense, let's, let's fix it and, and let's, let's collaborate. That's great, that's great. And I'll have to talk to you later about how we convert some of those internships to apprenticeships. Um, but Dan, um, maybe you could talk a little bit more too about, you, you talked about some of the retention and, and uh, recruitment strategies. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, about what are the workforce factors that Teva considers in any expansion or investment decisions? Yeah, so, um you know, Teva entered the U.S. market in the 80s, and th honestly, we grew a lot through acquisition. Um, so we weren't consciously selecting work sites, uh, but we did, through acquisition, um, really expand across, um, across the United States. And we've held on to sites where we think it matches our talent needs. So, you know, in, in some of the metropolitan areas that are connected to top universities, we've kept sites uh, where we have R&D employees because we feel that the collaboration with academia is really strong. So we have that in the suburbs of Philadelphia as well as in Cambridge and Boston. Um, we also, for manufacturing, um, have a very dispersed network of plants across the United States, which is helpful because it um, mitigates the risk if you have any problems with a particular plant, your, your supply and distribution is more evenly spread across the country. So I think there are some factors that have played into why we are where we are. Um, but I think what we look at, of course, is always um, first and foremost the, the quality of the talent that we need and where we can find it. And um, once we've determined that, then it's a balance of the cost of labor. Um, certain markets are definitely more expensive than others, and sometimes we decide consciously, yes, we're going to enter into that, that market uh, because the talent is strong and, and we're willing to pay for that talent. I, I think um, probably the third factor is really the legal and regulatory environment, uh, which can vary from state to state. And um, while you know it's important um, to have regulation, sometimes if regulation is uh, too burdensome, um, it's too much, it makes it difficult to operate our business. So um, the truth would be we would shy away from areas that are too heavily regulated. Um, it just makes it too hard and too expensive for us to do our work. Um, so I think uh, there, there would be some of the factors that we look sure. at. Sure, great, great. Decisions. All right, um, Don. Charlie gave a great testimonial there uh, to the great partnerships that uh, happen across Louisiana. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the programs you have in Louisiana? We've heard about Fast Start and others, um, but what, what makes Louisiana so successful in attracting uh, Well, it's a great question, uh, particularly in the context of, say, uh, Select USA. Uh, certainly anyone contemplating a foreign direct investment, uh, it has to be a very uh, keen consideration and concern about you know how do I uh, identify the workforce, hire the workforce, train the workforce. So for us to take on uh, that uh, challenge uh, for YCI became enormously important, and it's been important to both uh, domestic and foreign country uh, investors that we've had uh, across the board. Um, certainly, we've um, uh, built uh, one of the best workforce training programs in America. We've done this. Uh, in that most of uh, state agencies uh, will have 
much like the U.S. Department of Labor, a uh, uh, Department of Labor or Workforce Commission uh, that's embedded in government, and it's a, a very active and important one, and it receives federal funding and uh, uh, certain training funds and other opportunities. But it is outward facing. It's looking at the entire population and the citizens of your state. Uh, what we have uh, uniquely, and that's found in, in a few other states, is a workforce group, a task force, that's totally focused on this new industry and supporting them uh, from the very beginning as part of the conversation around recruitment and then uh, through the decision-making process and then through uh, construction and then through startup and then through the ramp of uh, employees and through the next expansion. Uh, so it is a long-term uh, public-private partnership that we seek uh, to provide this uh, outstanding workforce. And it's not really about putting the widgets together. Uh, that's a part of it. Uh, but it, it begins with uh, identifying, uh, recruiting, using these new uh, sophisticated tools uh, that, that allow uh, social media and other ways to uh, interact, to identify candidates, to bring those candidates forward, then to uh, have uh, classwork that seeks to do survey and determine who within this group are, are the individuals we want to be a, a, a member uh, to execute the mission of this uh, company and to operate within the kind of culture that this company seeks uh, to establish. And so uh, it may not be that you're looking for that person with a certain skill set. You're looking for that person that has the ability to learn almost any skill set. And so uh, helping to uh, identify this small universe of candidates and then introduce the candidates to the company. They make the selection of uh, who they want to bring on to uh, be trained. Uh, do that training, whether it's uh, uh, via a tablet, in a classroom setting, in a work-based setting. Uh, if we have to deploy uh, to uh, another country uh, to make the video of the kind of activities that take place and bring that back. Uh, you heard me speak earlier uh, about building uh, virtual reality modules and uh, augmented reality training modules, whatever it takes to give this uh, very sophisticated and successful approach to training these employees to be ready to go day one uh, is what our program uh, seeks to accomplish and then maintains uh, that long-term relationship. So uh, other states do have uh, some similar programs, uh, but the, the, the key elements in there are this uh, strong partnership with uh, the company uh, that you take on and, and focus specific <coughs> Uh, assets uh, in order to develop the training modules, copyright it to them, protect their IP, uh, uh, and, and build a culture that they direct. It's not in any way, shape, or form a, a one-size-fits-all. And I will also illuminate the other part that is so critical to the success that we've enjoyed, uh, that is critical to today's conversation as well. Uh, in the field of economic development, we've talked about it for more than 20 years the important integration and partnership of education and economic development. Um, but it's been, to be quite frank, much more lip service in the past. Uh, today, you can no longer really be successful uh, in that environment. Uh, so today, we take the corporation to the campus and we talk to uh, the campus about the kinds of skill sets in chemical engineering or uh, instrumentation or, or what the outcomes that we're seeking uh, to provide this very high quality job and to make sure that that is part of the program of instruction uh, for these graduates. Now, here's probably where it broke down in the past. You ring the doorbell at the university, tell them how important this is, they say thank you very much, and then they close the door. Uh, we are actually entering into contracts with the universities, with the community colleges that have specific performance requirements that we need these kind of certificates uh, to be coming forth and represented to the companies. And uh, in exchange for doing that, we have some dollars available 
so that you have uh, the resources as the university or the community college uh, to go and secure uh, the instructors for that program, the software for that program, uh, whatever the, the costs are, because uh, education is under the financial pressures the same way that uh, government and industry is. Uh, but uh, utilizing our program, which is called Fast Start, uh, to deliver this seamless workforce uh, to corporations and having these uh, extraordinary partnerships that we've built with universities and community colleges all over our state, uh, where we've had a state that with a, the leadership of our governor and uh, the allocation of resources from our legislature to actually put money that's investing in people uh, is uh, really moved the needle for us. Great, great. All right, one last question from me, so please get ready uh, with your questions. Um, Charlie, I just really want to give you a platform to tell us another story, because your first one was so great. It's a great okay. story. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So, so I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pitch it up, though. I mean, I'm one thing that's really of interest, uh, you know, certainly this administration and others, rural economic development is a big issue in this country, and just fascinated and would love to understand what gave you confidence to take that leap to invest in a rural uh, community in Louisiana and, and invest, make this big of an investment in that area. I'm sure it would have been a lot easier to pick a uh, urban area with a large workforce and, and uh, you know, plenty of people to retrain. So it was certainly a leap of faith. So I'd love to understand what gave you that confidence to take that leap and provide <coughs> that opportunity. Thank you. So talk about. Now he forced me to talk about stage one, why we picked the area. Now I come back to supplement what uh, down story and what we have done. We, uh, we have done with the state of Louisiana and why it makes us uh, successful. Yes, and then the site we selected in Louisiana is in the, in the parish called St. James. It only has 28,000 residents. It's predominantly sugar farm field. Mm. The predominant industry is either sugar can or the sugar mill. That's probably 80 uh, no, 20 to 30 percent of the local economy and the employment. Largest employer, I think, is a sugar mill and sugar farm uh, industry. And what we build is a chemical plant, state of art design. So that sounds like a really, really mismatch, right? Clearly, first point is the site selection is important. Yes, you tend to select the site for chemical plant, which will be less public population density, because otherwise, the chance for you to get permit. Anybody think about getting, going to going California? I'm not sure anybody come from California, <laughs> right? Your chance is zero, right? Or close to zero, right? So, and uh, so you do need to select site which is kind of business friendly, right? Or industry friendly. And in, for the chemical industry, I'm only talking about the industry sector that I am. It needs to be well, it's more inducive, right? It forced myself to build a plant in New Orleans, right? The chance is to be zero again, so. On the other hand, that's not just say you pick the raw area, solve your problem. It does have other things, right? For the industry, where you need to be close to raw material, which is natural gas. Texas, Louisiana, great. Right? You need to have uh, access to the power grid. We consume a lot of electricity. You need to have that. You need close to be a pipeline. We use a lot of fresh water. By sitting next door to Mississippi River, the water basically is free, right? You need to have a lot of uh, kind of logistics. You have to ship the product. Export, that's the deep sea. You have the ship product by barge. You have the ship product by rail and by truck. Once you pick those in, the site selection become pretty narrow to a few that's really of your needs. The next one is Mr. Dumpia, since I gave you so much good stuff, right? <laughs> At that point, you have to make a leap of faith, right? There's no right or wrong time to make a decision today that how economic force, trade wars, it's, uh, it's bad. Let's wait it to shake out. There's never a wrong time to make a decision because the decision you make, it's gonna last for 30 to 50 years. You think you're gonna time it right, you will always be wrong. So have that feeling and then make that decision to leave faces of really the first step, mm. which we made, mm. okay? So, but a lot of the investment decisions is also anchored kind of project economics. That's the raw material, the access to the mm -hmm. natural resources, mm -hmm. the logistics, all the others, and the permit, right? Mm -hmm. So those are decisions. So you could, you could have all those things, and if you don't have a workforce to uh, 
that comes to the next to one. To work at the plants, yeah. how do you make it work? Number one, you do have to look at the larger picture. If the larger picture is pessimistic, don't do it, right? I would not invest, pick a place to say in the, in the area which does not have a, a very large petrochemical industry because you're not going to find skilled work in that area. U.S. Gulf Coast, that's Texas and Louisiana, has more than 60% of U.S. installed petrochemical facility. So in a larger picture, your skilled workforce is there. In the particular parish we're in, it is not there. So you have to address, you cannot make a fatal flaw, pick an area that's no chemical plant, but you can address the localized problem, which is St. James Parish. So I think that maybe mm -hmm. answer the question. Absolutely. A couple of examples, what, something what Don has said. I just gave you the example how we work with. I mean, I truly believe the resource in this country is tremendous. Don't have to do all that yourself. You go find it, you will. Name a few examples, just how we work with the state, in particular with Don's economic development department, right? Number one, you want to recruit. People don't know you, right? You made a decision, you start building a plant. How do people get to know you, right? Okay, the platform of this nature, platform of many of this nature, Don and I, or many of the LED uh, folks, we go together. It's a way state put their name behind you. Make your name known. Actually, it's a free promotion, right? Mm. State has put together a dance department, put a, a video for YCI as a recruiting tool. Use the name of State Louisiana behind us. Okay, so that is a way to get your name because when you're in construction, you really have a few years to incubate that process, get your name out, get your name out in a positive way, right? That's that's number one step. Then the state or parish government has all kind of the available ways and means to help you. So the fast start is the one. They, when we did, tra we did job fail, for first high above 30 operators, we co-staff that job fail with the LED staff. And we, for 30 jobs, we have 500 people lined up for interview mm -hmm. on the screening. And that's even called a screening interview. The name, the job is well out already by the time you get there, okay? Then the next question is how you select them. You have to build your resource or use a third party. Actually, state of Louisiana already have the capability build. If I'm going to build a resource, HR resource to screen, screening 3,000 resume, 500, 500 interviews, you're never going to have that capability to, to do that. And you also invest that capability, you're going to do it once, right? So use the external resource where it's available to you, and, uh, and they are there, believe me. Okay. Industrial association, don't be shy. So it is not your solo journey. So in Louisiana, we are part of the manufacturing association. We are part of the chemical association. In the parish, we are in the next 25, which is industrial alliances to pull the resources together to strengthen the local education program. You want to get people to work for you, you have to be a good employer, right? But you get people wants to move that community, you do have to work with government to make them believe it is also a place to raise my family. Mm. That's a very, very big topic. A single employer would not be able to address. You have to form industrial alliances and go through public and private alliances to address that. So that's also important key. Very few people forgot. You got to make that community where they, they want to raise their family. Otherwise, you get them, you cannot keep them. Yep. That's another long story. <laughs> well, thank you. So clearly public-private partnerships, whether in Pennsylvania or Louisiana, are key. Uh, we have a few minutes left here, so uh, we have microphones on either side of the room. We'd love to get some questions. We'll try to take as many as we can. Um, my name is uh, Jack Carey of Carey Manufacturing in, in Connecticut. Um, we were one of the featured companies that brought work back from China. So we're um, now, um, I'm from an, in a unique position because uh, after college, I went through an apprenticeship at Pratt & Whitney mm. uh, Aircraft and the four-year thing. And uh, it was a masterful program that they had because in Connecticut, with the submarines and the aircraft mm. and everything we built there, I would say that a full 
50% of the small manufacturers, or probably guys like me, who started our own companies wow. as we got out of there. You know, so yep. these apprenticeship programs are, uh, are, are amazing things to go through. Now, one of the problems that I see is that uh, I went to Germany and, and looked at their program. Now, I'm not recommending that we use a German model because we're Americans yep. and we're just not that rigid and we shouldn't be. But it's a good place to start when you're putting these programs together. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that, uh, the, that I see a huge weakness in is, first of all, is government visibility. Now, Germans, at, what, 70 or 80 million people, the government puts $8 billion a year into their apprenticeship programs and internships, which for us would be $24 billion just on, on the economy yep. of scale. Mm -hmm. And the businesses commit an equal amount to that. Mm -hmm. Okay? The other thing that we have a problem with is our agrarian educational system, which goes to, um, ma'am, your point of the, in Russian, shag a shagam, step by step. It's high school, college, it shouldn't be that way. Businesses should be involved with these apprenticeships right from high school. Because if you get a person in, they train in your company, they don't leave. They stay in the company, like 85%. So integrating these things all in, the, in a package, you know, uh, is very, very important. And, and really, the businesses are out there willing to work, but the government leadership from the schools and from the policy is just not there. Mm -hmm. We need to get $25 billion or whatever it is into these things, and we've got to work them. I mean, as far as, you know, chasing the puck, go Bruins, right? <laughs> <laughs> but... I mean, we've really got to start considering this stuff because um, uh, that's what makes it all work. And the other problem we have in the rural areas is that people are going to continue to come to the cities. So we don't have enough people in the urban areas. You're going to find more in the rural areas who want to work up from what they're doing there. But we don't have enough people. And, that's, and it's not like people are trying to get in the country, right? But, I mean, we really don't have enough in the urban areas. And you got this huge problem with the rural areas going backwards. So, and that's going to be another area that has to be addressed a little more. But hitting these policy areas, mm -hmm. I don't know how you get the money and how you do it, but mm -hmm. that's what's got to occur. Sure. And, and just to, uh, I'm not sure I got a question in there necessarily, <laughs> but um, uh, I think there is a great point uh, around apprenticeship and um, uh, there are sort of what I'll call degrees of apprenticeship. Apprenticeship has a very uh, uh, strong connotation and you're in a rigid program uh, with a certificate or a certification at the end. Uh, and that's important and valuable. One of the things we're doing uh, just shy of that word apprenticeship is work-based learning and uh, working on getting some of those high school students onto uh, the plant form. Or, or into these other venues of work so that they can try it before they buy it. And so do you. You get to see if that employee is going to show up on time, uh, if they're going to be able to meet the safety standards, all those things. So uh, there is a, a formulation there uh, that we think is a, a great bridge uh, for both understanding uh, from um, the employer standpoint and from the student standpoint, uh, if we can do more of that type of integration. And we're doing outreach in our state right now to, uh, to, to foster that. And just quickly to piggyback, I pretty much agree with everything you said there. Um, you know, we have looked at a lot of our international comp uh, competitors and made a lot of changes. But just on the investment side, I mean, we've gone from zero federal dollars supporting apprenticeship about five years ago, where in the next year or two, there'll probably be a billion dollars in federal money um, invested in apprenticeship in various ways, including where uh, we just put out about 65 million to states across the country, 51 or so states are coming in uh, for apprenticeship funding. We're doing a marketing campaign uh, later this year. So a lot of the things you're talking about, we're moving in the right direction. Well, we, don't, we don't quite have the 24 uh, billion that you talked about to be on par, but uh, we're moving in the right direction. Next question. Well, hi, my name. Uh, right, right. Uh, my name is Charlene. I'm with China Daily. First of all, thank you very much for the very inspiring panel. I have a question for uh, 
Dr. Yao of Yu Huang. Uh, you talked about the first stage of uh, uh, made the decision, and second stage uh, build up the uh, factory. I have a question related to your third stage. How to, because you mentioned earlier, you want to build a factory that attract people to come and to stay. So what would be be your vision in terms of retaining the workforce? And what kind of advice uh, a Secretary Pearson can give to Dr. Yao in terms of uh, keeping those workers and make them happy? And I have uh, my last question goes beyond a little bit of this uh, topic, but I cannot help to throw it in. Uh, right now, US and China is uh, in the trade dispute. So, has the trade dispute affected any of your uh, investment here? Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. That's a long question. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so now I forgot the first half. I don't know how to frame it up. <laughs> so, yeah, I understand. Uh, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so, uh, the, the conversation I had with the, my HR manager, right? What is the HR job in my philosophy, right? I try job really is in the three buckets. Number one, it's recruiting, find a resource, right? The second one is retention. What do you do to keep them? The third one is called the development. That's the, my theme of what HR manager's job is. That's how we struck the company. Basically, on the HR, there are three functional groups, right? The recruiting is big for us because we're new, and of course, with a thousand construction worker, we're not talking about permanent staff hiring and that's 150 of them. And uh, so we're going through that stage, right? You start with 3,000 resumes, 500 interviews, and shortlist them, pass, go through the, the standard test. And the chemical industry, is, it's pretty interesting. You have some basic tests you have to pass in order to be qualified and go through interview. You hope the best ones are selected and, and then you can get them to work for you. So that comes to the middle one, which is called retention, right? Retention really comes a few uh, basic components. The first one I touch a little bit is you have all for a competitive uh, salary packages. If you don't, they are not coming, okay? And uh, the few things we do, I just give you the, 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 the story we, we do. So that's, that's a little flavor. It's just not competitive. What do you mean by competitive? Competitive means, in our, in our case, our base salary is at a 75 percentile of industry. It's not average. 75 percentile of the industry is really good, which translates to co fresh college graduates. It's about $60,000. I mean, it's a highly automated plan, right? You, the, basically, what the people we hire will end up to be, oh, really, by the time you select them, it's not required, but you're going to end up, but most of them have a college degree. That's the when you have 3,000 people fighting for 30 jobs, right? That's one in 100. Okay, that's 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 example of that. So uh, you have that. Now there are other things for the experienced workforces. Just salary is not going to get them. They are looking for other things more valuable, right? Give an example. A company give a vacation policy. M many of them give a vacation policy based policy based on the year of service you have in this company. You start with YCI, year one, two weeks, right? The experience works that I'm already five weeks, why am I giving them that come to you? So what we use, we use called industrial accredited services. How many years you work in the relevant industry, earn that. You have five weeks, you cut five weeks, okay? So there are many of the other components called flexible program you have to add to make you competitive, not only for the new workers, if your target market is experienced operator, in our case, it is, right? I cannot have everybody come out of college to run this plan. Most of our workforce has to be the one with 20, 15 to 20 years of experience. You have to design a program for that target market. Just, and there are a few other twists I'm just talking about, how to get them in the door. Then you talk about how to keep them, right? How to keep them, you have to have the competitive package that's as good as other employer, right? What I in particular talk about is to give them the opportunity to move up, right? It's hourly worker. So what they come in, they're gonna, if they think I'm gonna get an hour, $50 an hour, $30 an hour, next employee give me the same thing I can move. What you offer them is the opportunity to move up. It's a brand new plan. 
right? So the leadership is a vacuum. Whoever proves themselves is the chance they can move beyond the hourly operator, become the shift supervisor, right? Become your uh, operations manager, right? And become the, that ladder, continue that. In a new company, it's much easier to say it than the established one because I just don't have any job filled. You can say that people will believe you, right? So the up move, and uh, clearly the big enough operation uh, plan allow them to cross move. Mm -hmm. Those are all the opportunities you offer the people to make them feel you really care. And this is a good company to work for and to work for the long term. Great, thank you. I think unfortunately we're over our time here uh, this afternoon, but I would encourage if folks are available to find any of us after the session and we're happy to continue the conversation. But I would like to thank our great panel and uh, if we can give them a round of applause, that would be great. Thank you. Again, just more information than we can cover in an hour. So again, hopefully the conversation can, can continue. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the conference.